ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Prasenji Chakravarti and I'm a partner in Khetan's m a Corporate Group. On behalf of the firm, uh, I would like to extend to each of you a very warm welcome to this webinar, whether you are in our audience in India or abroad. This is the second webinar of our m a Master Series in 2023 and we look forward to your company throughout the remaining part of the series. We have been thrilled with the tremendous response to this year's m a Webmaster Series. Literally thousands of registrations for webinars across the series. We are very grateful for the interest and support which our clients, associates and others have shown this year. Today, we will discuss regulatory controls on inbound cross-border m &As. Now, inbound cross-border m &As is something which entails acquisition, or investment in the Indian company by a non-resident company, which really is governed by a maze of uh, different regulatory laws. Now, of course, undoubtedly, the Indian dispensation has over the years progressively liberalized the foreign direct investment regime, right from replacing and overhauling the draconian Foreign Exchange Regulation Act to the Foreign Exchange Management Act, opening up sectors at, and doors to foreign investment since 1991 and substantially reducing the burden in so far as foreign exchange law compliance is concerned. Despite that, uh, there are certain regulations which a foreign investor must be cognizant of and take due care of when it structures and makes an investment into an Indian company, failing which there could be adverse consequences and a suboptimal m a deal. So we will talk about in today's presentation whole gamut of issues right from current account, capital account transactions, escrows, holdbacks, uh, sectors which are regulated, prohibited, so on and so forth. Uh, what we will not touch upon today are very specific technical points like competition law tax because those are specialist subjects and if you go to Khetan's playlist, you will find access to those topics separately. On this slide, you can see the agenda for the day. The uh, agenda really will flow uh, with a short presentation by Atul, followed by a Q&A session from the audience questions. We have already received plenty of audience questions in advance. And should you have any questions during the course of this webinar, please feel free to submit that using the webinar portal. If you cannot cover all the questions during the Q&A exchange uh, during this webinar, we will surely get back to you separately after the webinar. Also after the webinar, we will send across to you a copy of the presentation which will be presented today, a summary notes of the key issues discussed, a link to the recording of the webinar as well. Of course, we'll upload the webinar on the uh, YouTube portal as well. Every person who has registered for this webinar today has already received an email with full particulars of our panelists today. So I will not spend much time repeating and summarizing Atul's experience. Suffice to say, if uh, there is anyone who is very well qualified to talk on regulatory issues, it's Atul given his vast experience uh, and credentials in, in this space. We are very fortunate to have Atul with us today, who is a leading lawyer in our firm's restructuring m a and regulatory uh, aspects. So I think without further ado, why don't I invite Atul to deliver his presentation uh, on, on this topic. Over to you, Atul. Thank you. Thank you, Prasanji. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction and setting the stage with respect to this presentation. So today, actually, I will deal with the regulatory framework with respect to how foreign investor can invest in India, as well as what are the key aspects with respect to such investment in relation to nature of the transaction, depending on the nature of the transaction, whether there is any approval requirement, whether there is any specific reporting requirement, all of that I will cover in this presentation. In addition to that, I will also deal with uh, certain key aspects with respect to investments coming from bordering countries in India. For example, uh, last year, 
couple of years back through press note 3 government of india issued a notification with respect to investment coming from those jurisdictions so what are the key aspects with respect to such investments i will deal with this in this presentation and lastly then i will also cover what are the reporting requirements once you uh, complete the transaction so without taking much of time i am just going to present you the first slide with respect to my presentation which is the regulatory framework in relation to inbound foreign investments now for that first of all we have to refer to uh, the governing policy framework and i have divided this in two parts if you can see in the slide one is under the foreign exchange management act which lays down the broad parameters with respect to any investment where foreign exchange is involved and the second part is foreign direct investment policy which is a policy document issued by government of india through ministry of commerce so foreign exchange management act as well as foreign direct investment policy uh, these together govern any investments in india where either foreign exchange is involved or where any specific clarification is required with respect to a transaction where a foreign investor is investing into india now under the foreign exchange management act ministry of finance has also laid down certain rules and regulations and in addition to that reserve bank of india has also issued master directions uh, master circulars as well as faqs so all of this combined would be referred to whenever an investor is looking to invest into india now non debt instrument rules 2019 uh, this lays down the policy framework with respect to any investment as well as all the critical aspects with respect to inbound transaction and the reserve bank of india and ministry of finance has been authorized to provide mechanism with respect to such investments now foreign direct investment policy as i mentioned uh, it's a broad policy framework which is laid down by ministry of commerce and every uh, alternate year i would say last foreign direct investment policy was issued in 2020 and then it is year on year updated through various press notes or circulars or by way of clarifications by ministry and to take it the shape of law foreign exchange management act and uh, rules and regulations are issued by either ministry of finance or by the reserve bank of india now with respect to foreign direct investment policy as i mentioned since it is issued by uh, ministry of commerce through department for promotion of industry and internal trade so therefore they become the nodal agency to govern uh, any any such investment next slide now in terms of the policy framework which i just discussed uh, any investment in india we have to first see whether investment uh, in which sector the investment is coming and uh, what is the law around that so whether as any foreign investment is allowed and in what manner it is allowed whether it is allowed under the automatic route whether it is allowed under the approval route or whether there is no uh, foreign investment allowed in uh, this sector so for that we have to refer to the policy framework which we just discussed so one so when the sector in which foreign investor is looking to invest comes under the automatic route it means that no approval is required in that sector and as we all know indian economy is fully open for foreign investment barring few sensitive sectors so therefore it is very safe to say that uh, you know today most of the, in most of these sectors foreign investor can set up or acquire any indian entity without any such approval now the second category would be the approval route sector as i mentioned only uh, key sensitive sectors are under the approval route uh, for example pharmaceuticals of course uh, up to 74 percent in pharmaceutical it is allowed under the automatic route but beyond 74 percent government approval will be required considering the sensitivity with respect to pharma sector likewise uh, there are certain sectors where any investment uh, is allowed only with the government approval for example uh, broadcasting likewise if foreign investor is not meeting uh, specific conditions with respect to the certain sector or is not meeting one of the conditions laid down under foreign exchange management act or non debt instrument rules then in that case also approval requirement may get triggered so depending upon the sector depending upon the nature of the transaction 
and uh, depending on non compliance or inability to comply with the sectoral condition uh, approval requirement may, may get triggered now in india certain sectors are absolutely prohibited for foreign investment so which means that no foreign investor can uh, uh, do any business in such sector and even with the approval government approval uh, it is not allowed some of the sectors when foreign investment is not allowed is uh, gambling tobacco etc one key aspect here i would also like to deal with uh, in the previous slide please where i have mentioned prohibited sector uh, one 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 key aspect is whether real estate uh, uh, investment is allowed in india by foreign investor or not now real estate from foreign uh, direct investment policy perspective would be buying and selling of land. So if a foreign investor is only looking to buy and sell the land, then uh, such, such activity is not allowed. But having said that, if foreign investor is looking to acquire the land, develop it, and thereafter sell it, then that is allowed and that is treated as uh, development construction uh, or, or infrastructure development overall. So their foreign direct investment is allowed. It was critical for me to uh, make this distinction. Therefore, uh, you know, I specifically report this particular sector. Next sector, uh, next slide, please. Now, in terms of the policy framework, uh, as I mentioned, certain sectors when government approval is required. Uh, so 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 the onus to give such approval is given to the nodal ministry which is actually regulating the sector so for example if investment is coming in pharmaceutical sector then it will be department of pharma which comes under ministry of health and family welfare they will be giving the approval in case if the investment is coming in telecom sector then approval will be given by ministry of telecommunication through department of telecom Likewise, if investment is coming in information on broadcasting sector, then Ministry of Information and Broadcasting would be the nodal authority to give such approval. So, so on and so forth. Now, when you actually make the application, uh, the key, uh, key criteria to get the approval through that application would be, you know, you are complying with the sectoral condition. You are providing complete information with respect to such investment all of that has to be covered in your application very important to highlight uh, you know the benefits which will be accruing to the indian economy through such investment uh, the employment opportunities which will be generated uh, the entire beneficial owner ownership chain should be provided for uh, you know the in, in the application you also have to provide for uh, you know how much investment is going to come in how many tranches it is going to come uh, you know, and 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 uh, you will be complying with the sectoral condition, etc. So once all of that information is provided to government of India, then of course the sector regulator would look into that and accordingly give the approval. I will deal more uh, of the procedure in question and answer and maybe uh, you know in further slides. But this is the broad process when it comes to applying to uh, the regulator. Lastly, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, depending on the nature of the transaction, whether the transaction is a current account transaction or a capital account transaction, uh, approval requirement may also get triggered. So it may happen that the sector is under the automatic route, but because either the sectoral conditions are not being complied with or some of the aspects with respect to foreign exchange, uh, you know, those conditions which are provided in the policy framework that is not being complied with, then approval requirement may get triggered from reserve bank of india as well this approval requirement is in addition to what i just discussed uh, with respect to the sector regulator so for instance uh, if you are not complying with one of the condition for example uh, in relation to a indian entity which is foreign owned and controlled and if they want to make downstream investment and they are not complying with some of the conditions which are provided for downstream investment then uh, we have to first see what is the nature of such transaction and if it falls under a current or a capital account transaction and specifically if it falls under capital account transaction then uh, we have to uh, see whether the approval requirement from reserve bank of india gets triggered or not this is one example but there could be other instances as well uh, you know once you actually look into the policy framework lastly which is very important when you are actually 
making an application with respect to sensitive sector or investments which are coming from neighboring countries uh, which share land border with India, then in those cases, uh, there is an element of security clearance from Ministry of Home Affairs. So that security clearance aspect should be taken into consideration because it becomes critical because unless the security clearance comes, uh, no approval will be given by the Nodal Ministry or Reserve Bank of India. Next slide, please. Now, some of the foreign exchange issues with respect to an inbound FDI or which a foreign investor should be mindful of. So I have I have uh, broadly provided uh, seven, eight such criteria or, or aspects which, uh, you know, one should be mindful of. Sometimes the investment comes either directly and in many cases indirectly. So when uh, we talk about directly, that means that foreign investor has to simply look into the policy framework depending on sector in which it is coming. And if there is an approval requirement, then uh, of course application can be filed. And if it falls under the automatic route, no approval uh, requirement gets triggered. But having said that, what is indirect foreign investment? Now, indirect foreign investment is when an Indian entity makes downstream investment, further investment into another entity. Now, if that Indian entity which makes the downstream investment is foreign owned and controlled, then down and, and any such investment by such Indian entity would then be categorized as a downstream investment. And for that, we have to refer to Regulation 23 of non debt instrument rules to make sure that uh, you are complying with those conditions which are provided therein. So, for example, when a FOCC, foreign owned and controlled Indian entity, makes a downstream investment, very important aspect is that they cannot uh, raise any loan or debt from the domestic market. Similarly, uh, it, it, it is clearly stipulated that the investment has to come either from the internal accruals or it has to uh, come from abroad by, through the foreign investor who is holding investment into such FOCC entity. So therefore, these are key uh, you know, items which one should be mindful of in relation to indirect foreign investment. And if any of these conditions are not being met, then as I mentioned, uh, one has to take approval from Reserve Bank of India, depending on the nature of the transaction. Similarly, uh, in relation to inbound FDI, previously, in relation to inbound FDI, uh, there could be a concept of indemnity, or there could also be a concept of deferred consideration or creating of an escrow mechanism. So in all these cases, uh, we have to refer to the policy framework where it has been clearly provided that if a seller who is exiting from an Indian entity, uh, he wants to provide certain indemnity. So such indemnity is allowed. But having said that such indemnity cannot be more than 25% of the total consideration. And the maximum period for such indemnity would be 18 months. Likewise, in relation to default consideration also, uh, whenever a transaction takes place between non-resident and a resident, a uh, certain consideration can be deferred and that consideration can be deferred up to a period of 18 months and for a maximum uh, consider uh, up to 25% of the overall consideration. Likewise, for that same purpose, an escrow can also be created in India and that 25% can be kept in escrow. What I want to uh, highlight is that in case if these conditions are not being met, then approval requirement may get triggered from Reserve Bank of India and therefore uh, the foreign investor should be mindful of uh, uh, you know the approval requirement in relation to non-compliance with any of these conditions. Similarly optionality clauses are also provided for uh, whenever uh, a foreign investor is investing they can put in certain call option put option in the transaction documents and so that is also allowed uh, but but it is important to note that uh, there is a lock-in of one year, which means that there cannot be an exit uh, by, uh, by the foreign investor before that period of one year. And also there cannot be an assured return because assured return is in the nature of debt and uh, debt is governed by a separate set of regulation and uh, RBI as well as government strictly uh, discourages any kind of assured return. Similarly, uh, all the inbound investment through the DI route that has to be through either equity instruments or equity-like instruments. 
So what is equity instrument is when you are actually directly investing into the shares of an Indian company. An equity-like instrument uh, which is recognized under the FDI policy would be uh, any compulsory convertible debentures or preference shares. If it is if if uh, this condition is not being complied with, then such investment is not allowed, and so that, that investment would be treated as debt and not as a foreign investment. Now, any other instrument, as I mentioned, only equity or equity-like in, uh, instruments are recognized. So, any other instrument, so for example, non-convertible debentures, optionally convertible debentures or preference shares, all of that would be treated as debt and they will be governed by external commercial borrowing guidelines. Lastly, all such investments into an Indian entity, whether by way of subscription or by way of acquisition of the existing shares, uh, it has to be complied with in accordance with pricing guideline laid down by Reserve Bank of India. And it says that the pricing should be as per international pricing methodology. And in case of listed company, it has to be as per uh, SEBI guidelines. So valuation and pricing uh, guidelines uh, should be complied with. And if it is not being complied with, then approval requirement from Reserve Bank of India would get triggered. Then there could be other aspects also. Sometimes foreign investor uh, who has actually given technology or who has incurred certain expenses or has provided machinery or anything wherein you know there is no cash involved. In such cases, also shares can be issued, but it has to be as per the policy framework. So there are certain, as I mentioned, there are certain transactions when uh you know in case payment is not being made by the indian entity in relation to such transaction then shares can be issued so for example if a foreign investor if a foreign entity has supplied uh, capital goods or machinery or has provided technical license or know-how or against that shares can be issued so but for that we need to identify in which sector investment is coming whether there is an approval requirement or not and if it is under automatic route no approval is required but if it is under the government route then approval will be required depending on the sector also shares can be issued uh, uh, you know via swap as well so which means that foreign investor can issue shares uh, of a foreign entity to the indian uh, parties or the indian investor in relation to acquiring shares of an indian entity so share swap is also uh, an important uh, consideration in case if it is involved in relation to that transaction next slide please now some of the emerging trends which we see you know in recent uh, based on our recent experience with government of course while government is very eager to uh, boost ease of, do, uh, ease of doing business and at the same time, they are liberalizing uh, foreign direct investment policy, and they have opened a lot of these sectors for foreign investors to invest into the automatic route. I will deal with uh, some of the recent steps which had been taken by the government uh, recently to open some of the sectors under the automatic route in a later slide. So, but this is very important. Government, of course, is open. They are setting up various desks depending on, uh, you know, from where investment is coming. Uh, for example, if investment is coming from Japan, there's a dedicated Japanese desk for investment if in, uh, in uh, for for instance, if investment is coming from France or US, there's a separate desk for that. So these desks, as well as Invest India, all of that actually help foreign investors in case if they have any issues with respect to any of the inbound transaction. Likewise, we also see because of a recent notification, and also certain sensitivities being involved government of india is looking uh, into the key aspects with respect to beneficial ownership so therefore what we see is that uh, a lot of information and data is being asked with respect to beneficial ownership in relation to inbound transaction and otherwise also in relation to existing investments government is uh, increasingly uh, scrutinizing the beneficial ownership details of the investors also, as I mentioned, sometimes shares can be issued against uh, any technical uh, services which, ha which had been provided for or, or any royalty uh, against any royalty. But at the same time, we have also seen that government is asking for excessive details with respect to you know, the payment which had been made against royalty, license fees, services, etc. 
reason being because government feels that sometimes uh, you know the payment which has been made is disproportionate to uh, the outward remittance which has been made against such services and therefore enforcement department and the government investigating agencies are increasingly uh, uh, you know issuing notices to a number of foreign investors so therefore when you are actually entering or advising on an inbound transaction uh, it becomes very important to make sure that uh, your licensing arrangement uh, your service arrangement all of that should be at arm's length there should be a transfer pricing there should be benchmarking etc because this is based on our experience and dealing for several clients and helping them in relation to these trends next slide now as i mentioned a uh, couple of years back government of india issued a press note called press note 3 and this press note was to deal with any investments which are coming from outside uh, from a country which shares land border with india so the background for this press note was during covid times government felt that because of falling valuations of the indian entities there is a possibility that chinese investors and those funds with deeper pockets can acquire indian companies at a very low valuation which may result in loss of foreign exchange and the control may also go in the hands of chinese investors and the first trigger point for this was basically people's bank of china they raised some stake in sdfc bank in india and post that this press note 3 was issued now press note 3 actually covers all investments which are coming from a country which shares land border with india and is specifically aimed at and targeted uh, towards china and the funds uh, where beneficial ownership is basically in the hands of chinese entities or chinese uh, individuals now in terms of this press note any investment coming from these neighboring countries whether direct or indirect and all kind of investments would fall under the approval route so approval route means that sector in which investment is coming uh, if the beneficial owner ship of the investor is uh, in china or jurisdictions which share land border with india then approval will be required now the relevant ministry to manage the approval process would be the sector regulator as i had highlighted in the previous slide and in this under press note 3 all kind of ownership direct whether or indirect and all kind of investments are covered so for example uh, if there is a Chinese investor who already has an existing Indian investment, uh, they get any rights issue or bonus issue. Even that kind of investments uh, are also covered under Press Note 3. It's not just a fresh investment or it's not just a follow on investment. It is also uh, these kind of investments which are covered under Press Note 3. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, since uh, under Press Note 3, both direct and indirect investments are covered. While direct, everyone would be clear because if an investor entity is located in China or Hong Kong, uh, definitely Press Note 3 will be triggered. But in relation to indirect, uh, since there is no criteria or threshold which has been provided for as to what constitutes beneficial ownership in relation to indirect investment, so therefore a certain clarity was required although that clarity was not provided by the government through any of uh, follow-on clarifications but based on market practice what we see is that uh, reliance or, or or reference has been made to existing uh, legislations in india wherein significant beneficial ownership or beneficial ownership has been defined so for example under the indian companies act significant beneficial ownership criteria has been provided as 10 percent so similarly under the prevention of money laundering act while previously the beneficial ownership criteria was provided as 25 percent or the threshold was being provided as 25 percent but it has now been reduced to 10 percent for the government of india uh, two years back uh, you know with respect to public procurement which means that whenever there is a supply to any of the government or, or state-owned enterprise uh, they laid down this criteria that if 
the the supplier entity is having more than 25% uh, control or ownership from china hong kong or a country which shares land border with india then in that case approval or registration would be required why i'm highlighting this is because in relation to indirect investment since there is no threshold which has been provided for uh, with respect to beneficial ownership so therefore we have to refer to these uh, legislations or or these uh, these guidelines which are which are provided for government of india and accordingly uh, the view the market view is that if in relation to an indirect investment if the Chinese beneficial ownership is less than 10% and the investment is coming into an automatic root sector, then no approval should is required. This is based on this is based on the market precedence. Although, as I clarified, there is there is no uh, clarification which is issued by government of India, but this is based on the market precedent and certain uh, clarifications uh, which authorized dealer banks have internally received from the regulators based on their informal uh, discussion with these regulators next slide so some of so some of the key aspects under pn press note 3 uh, one as i mentioned if the investment is coming in automatic root sector and the chinese beneficial ownership is less than 10 percent then it may be safe to assume subject to uh, discussions with authorized dealer bank and an investment is coming in automatic root sector that no approval is required under press note 3. having said that if the investment is coming in a regulated sector or a sector which requires government approval then of course uh, approval requirement would get triggered similarly uh, we while we have taken number of approvals for several chinese uh, investors under press note 3 but having said that, uh, what I would like to identify through this slide and through this presentation is that if the investor is holding, the beneficial owner is holding more than 10% and the sector is an automatic root sector, and so long as the beneficial owner, owner is not going to exercise control, then we have seen that government is inclined to and has given several such approvals. So therefore, if the sector is automatic route and there is no control by Chinese investors, although there is beneficial ownership, but that beneficial ownership is above 10% and less than 50%, uh, we feel that, uh, you know, it would be easier to get the approval. Similarly, in the approval route sector, uh, you know, even 1% uh, investment would require approval, whether it's under press note 3 or whether it is, uh, you know, under, under the general policy. But having said that, uh, in those sectors where uh, what we have noticed is that where there is partial cap which is allowed under the automatic route, uh, you know, we have seen that regulators have asked uh, the parties to take approval uh, even though they were falling under the automatic route. So very important for you to identify the sector, whether the sector is fully automatic or partially automatic. If it is partially automatic, very important to discuss with authorized dealer banks as well as with the sector regulator before closing the transaction now direct investment uh, in the indian subsidiaries or in the joint ventures by an investor who is located in any of uh, the country which shares land border with india uh, approval requirement to get triggered under press note 3. very important aspect under with respect to pn3 and we receive a lot of questions whether taiwan is covered under press note 3 or not so my answer would be since it is not specifically provided for and there is no clarification which has been issued by government of india but based on the precedents what we have seen and i was personally involved in relation to hong kong uh, we have seen that government is very clear and they have given us approvals as well with respect to investments coming from hong kong under press note 3 but in relation to taiwan uh, based on our informal discussion with the government as well as through the authorized dealer banks it appears that taiwan is not covered under press note 3. having said that uh, if there is a specific transaction then it is advised to take a specific clarification from authorized dealer before uh, closing or proceeding uh, with such transaction uh, lastly globally listed companies uh, with chinese investments so what it means is that if there is a listed company in us which may have chinese public shareholders 
but they may not be exercising control and they may also be in excess of 10 percent but they are public shareholders and they have been identified as public shareholders without any control then uh, in our view uh, approval requirement may not get triggered because uh, public shareholders may not be treated as ultimate beneficial owner for for the purpose of pn3 having said that again uh, one should definitely check with authorized dealer bank if any investment is coming uh, into india otherwise in relation to indirect investment in a global listed company of course uh, that that view can be adopted now some of the liberalizing uh, liberalization trends which we have seen recently as i mentioned in the previous slide as well government is open to foreign investment and uh, kind of trying to allow foreign investors in even some of the key sectors so for example telecom uh, telecommunication this sector was under the government approval round until 2021 but government opened up this sector and today 100 percent foreign investment is allowed in telecommunication sector without any government approval similarly defense sector which was partially uh, under the automatic route and partially under the approval route now the cap is increased from 49 percent to 74 percent under the automatic route and beyond 74 percent up to 100 percent under the approval route also in the insurance sector uh, through press store 2 of 2021 government opened foreign investment uh, under the automatic route for in, uh, investment into insurance intermediaries so which means that if uh, some investment is coming in uh, uh, entity which is in the business of insurance intermediary then of course uh, no approval uh, would, would be required lastly in lic also government of india has last year opened up to 20 percent under the uh, automatic route so that is also a liberalization we have seen next slide as i mentioned uh, you know while indian economy is fully open and most of the sectors are under the automatic route despite that while some sectors are under the automatic route or partially under the automatic route and partially under the approval route but they are they are of course there are a lot of sector related specific conditions and therefore we feel that these are critically regulated sectors and if investment is coming on in some of these sectors of course uh, the investor or 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 uh, you know the transaction advisor needs to make sure that uh, sector related conditions are complied with so for example in e-commerce uh, you know fdi is allowed up to 100 percent what is e-commerce as we all know is providing a marketplace and facilitate uh, transactions, uh, selling of goods and services between buyer and seller. But having said that, uh, if it becomes an inventory-based model of e-commerce, then foreign investment is not allowed. And how inventory-based model is uh, defined or identified, uh, you know, this for this, we have to refer to uh, a specific press note. We call it as press note two of 2018, when uh, you know, uh, government has laid down certain criteria to identify whether it's a inventory-based model or a marketplace model. So, in, when, in the inventory-based model, FDI is not allowed, uh, but at the same time, in the marketplace model, uh, FDI is allowed. Further, in pharmaceutical uh, projects, so again, government has categorized this in two parts. One is greenfield pharma, and the other is brownfield pharma. In greenfield pharma, 100% foreign investment is allowed without any restriction. Uh, in brownfield pharma, foreign investment is allowed up to 100%, but up to 74% it is allowed under the automatic route, and beyond 74% it is allowed under the approval route. Now, some of the conditions with respect to pharmaceutical sector is that no non-compete uh, clause uh, should be uh, executed between the parties, which means that uh, when an Indian seller is exiting or Indian promoter is exiting and selling in favor of a non-resident, uh, he cannot be restricted to undertake the same business. Similarly, some of the other condition three criteria with respect to pharmaceutical is that you have to make sure that the research and development expenses, which an Indian brownfield pharmaceutical entity has been uh, doing, that should be maintained over a period of next five years. Likewise, if that Indian entity is into uh, you know manufacturing of national list of essential medicines so that should also be uh, you know continued so you cannot like discontinue but after acquiring that uh, entity lastly in relation to digital media also previously digital media there was no clarity 
uh, it was of course uh, uh, the view was that it is open for foreign investment up to 100 percent but having said that government then issued a notification and brought it at par with uh, you know print media as well as electronic media and today now foreign investment is only allowed up to 26 percent subject to uh, other conditions with respect to such sector and the guidelines laid down by ministry of information and broadcasting next slide so as i discussed uh, uh, previously uh, you know uh, once you have identified and have obtained approval where approval is required or close the transaction where no such approval is required then comes the stage of reporting the transaction now every transaction has to be reported depending on nature of the transaction so for example if foreign investor is acquiring existing shares of an indian company from existing investors then form fctrs is to be filed and that form fctrs has to be filed within 60 days likewise if the foreign investor is is actually subscribing to the new shares of an indian entity then in that case within 30 days form fcgpr is to be filed uh, you know this form fcgrs as well as fcgpr has to be filed online through a website developed by reserve bank of india uh, fi rms forms portal we call it so make sure that uh, it has to be uh, you know complied with within the prescribed timeline through the mechanism which is provided under uh, the reporting requirement uh, guidelines laid down by reserve bank of india so when you actually uh, go for filing form fctrs or form fcgpr uh, you have to approach to authorized dealer bank so authorized dealer bank will actually do kyc check of uh, the parties as well, as well as they will ask information with respect to the beneficial owners uh, also the authorized dealer bank will check all the past compliances and 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 may ask you to regularize non compliances if any so they will of course go through the entire reporting history and if there is any non compliance or if there is uh, you know any irregularity with respect to the previous transactions of uh, in relation to the entity in which foreign investment is coming then uh, this may delay or hamper the entire transaction uh, in addition to that with form fctrs and fcgpr uh, transaction documents your spa share purchase agreement shareholder agreement valuation uh, report and and to make sure that you have complied with pricing guidelines all of that has to be submitted a very important uh, advice from my side would be you know that before closing of the transaction and, and and at each stage it is important to have discussions with your authorized dealer bank so that there should not be any last minute hiccups and transaction is not uh, you know getting closed because of because of these hiccups also if form fctrs or fcgpr is not filed within time then rbi ha rbi has provided a mechanism with respect to late submission fees and uh, uh, you know there could be significant penalty for for delay uh, in non filing of fctrs or fcgpr next slide please so 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 broad key takeaways with respect to what i just discussed uh, and and this is very important with respect to all the inbound transactions where foreign investment or, or foreign exchange issues are involved first and most important is regulatory diligence uh, you know before before entering into or before proceeding uh, to the regulator it is important to make sure that you have done a thorough diligence with respect to your previous transactions because if that is not done and you have approached to the regulator and regulator finds it uh, finds that there are certain contraventions or you have not uh, you know complied with the regulations uh, with respect to your previous transactions or the transaction is not properly executed entered into or 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 there could be any hiccups with respect to uh, the regulatory provisions then of course uh, you will not get the approval from the regulator or even if you get the approval it will be a delayed approval and sometimes we have seen that this may lead to dropping of the transaction as well secondly uh, seek specific regulatory advice during the negotiation phase itself so that all the key, key elements and and compliance requirements are factored in your uh, 
SPA and, and definitive documents. So involve and take regulatory advice at, at this stage of term sheet itself. And then uh, as and when transaction progresses, you make sure that uh, you know all the regulatory uh, requirements are taken into consideration in your definitive documents. Lastly, as I mentioned, uh, because government is increasingly looking into the beneficial ownership, uh, not only under Press Note 3, but otherwise also, and also uh, authorized dealer banks have been asking for a lot of information with respect to beneficial ownership. So do a thorough analysis because what we have seen is sometimes, uh, you know, while you have closed the transaction, but the transaction uh, uh, reporting is not completed or approval you have not got because you are not able to satisfy with some of the information or documents which either the authorized dealer bank or the government is asking with respect to beneficial ownership. So it is very important to do a thorough analysis of your beneficial ownership and make sure that uh, you disclose only that information when you are comfortably able to provide uh, such information to the government. So I hope uh, I was able to give a, a you know thorough presentation with respect to the key elements, but happy to take any questions around it, uh, either in this uh, webinar or uh, you know, by way of side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atul, for, for really what is, I think, a riveting and fabulous presentation. Very comprehensive, uh, very informative. Uh, and as I can see, there are a flurry of questions which uh, have flooded my inbox. Uh, and I think uh, I will just take some of them. Actually, Mitesh, you can take off the slides. And after we are done with the QA, then you can uh, bring the slides back. There you go. So, so Atul, I'm just trying to quickly screen to the first question. Again, no uh, prizes for guessing. It's around press note three, uh, the big elephant in the room, isn't it? I think uh, two, three connected questions. I'm just kind of uh, joining them. First is, uh, have you secured any PN3 approvals? Uh, if so, uh, how much time it took for obtaining such an approval? Which sector it pertained to? And what documentary evidence your clients, uh, etc., you had to furnish to get that? Yeah. So, uh, Prasenji, thank you for this question. Actually, we have obtained several approvals uh, for various uh, investors. Either uh, you know, either they are located in China or Hong Kong, as I mentioned, or in case of indirect investment, where beneficial ownership is located in China or Hong Kong. So as of now, I think we have obtained more than 25, 30 approvals uh, under Press Note 3. But having said that, uh, while in the first year, government was not very inclined to, or very reluctant, I would say, because, because at that point of time, there were certain issues going on. And then, of course, this mechanism was being developed by government. So they were also learning. Uh, and in the initial uh, first one year, there were no approvals. But once the government system got uh, streamlined, then we see that now government is uh, comfortable giving the approval. Uh, so far as timeline is concerned, it is seven to eight months minimum, which one can expect. And the reason for this timeline is because uh, several government ministries are involved. And most important element here would be, uh, you know, the Ministry of Home Affairs security clearance, because uh, the moment press note 3 comes uh, in the mind of the regulator, it becomes a sensitive issue. And uh, government is specifically asked from Ministry of Home Affairs as well as Ministry of External Affairs to give their security clearance and no objection. In addition to that, government has also constituted uh, an IMC interministerial committee to look into and approve press note 3 applications. And because of uh, this, this uh, interleaving, uh, you know, seven to eight months uh, timeline is what we see with respect to such uh, PN3 applications. You are on mute, Prasenjit. I can't hear you. Sorry. In addition to that, I would also like to highlight with respect to Press Note 3 is that uh, when you actually reach out to the regulator, as I mentioned in one of my slides, that uh, if the investment is 
in an automatic root sector, non-sensitive sector. And so long as the Chinese investors are not going to exercise control uh, and are below 50 percent, uh, you know, uh, shareholding, then in that case, approvals are forthcoming. Uh, is what we see. Right. So I think I think one connected question, you know, Atul, Atul, uh, I had for you was that: Have you seen rejections also in Presno three applications? And if so, what factors contributed towards such rejections? Yeah, we have seen rejections as well. Uh, so, so, so there are two reasons why uh, these rejections took place. One is, of course, government is not inclined, uh, uh, you know, an investment coming from bordering countries in a sensitive sector. So, and sensitive sector from government's perspective would be pharmaceutical, telecom. Uh, you know, uh, data is also a sensitive uh, topic. So even in uh, fintech also, we are seeing government is not very uh, inclined to give approvals. So one is, of course, sensitivity of the sector. The other is, you know, linked to the beneficial ownership. Now, if the beneficial owners are linked with PLA or, or People's Liberation Army or with the political establishment in China or Hong Kong, or at the same time, uh, if there is a linkage to a state-owned enterprise in any of these jurisdictions, then also we have seen that uh, government is rejecting uh, the approval. So one is, of course, the majority control. The other is sensitivity of the sector. And thirdly, linkage to any of these uh, entities or organizations. Right. Right. I think a couple of more questions on, on PN3 before I move to uh, other topics. Uh, I think I think somebody is proposing to make an investment it seems and and the question is i heard being mentioned that pn3 also encompasses indirect investment uh, so let's say if i am planning to invest from germany and but i have group companies in china should i be uh, getting advice to scrutinize the structure and see if any approval is required or not under place note 3 I think the answer is yes, because I think it, you did mention indirect uh, acquisition should be covered. But what's your answer to that, Atul? Yeah, so indirect investment is covered. Having said that, if the beneficial owners are not located in China or Hong Kong, then a German uh, entity, which is actually beneficially owning the investor entity, even though they have investments in China and Hong Kong or Pakistan, uh, approval requirement under PN3 would not get triggered because PN3 is entirely linked with beneficial ownership and not where all they have actually invested. So, so, so to answer to this would be, uh, you know, PN3 would not get triggered uh, just by virtue of having your presence in China or Hong Kong, so long as your beneficial ownership is not located in any of these uh, jurisdictions. Right. Right. But of course, I think the message being one should examine the structure carefully so that you're not inadvertently missing the the regulatory requirement uh, yeah. there. So that's important. That's I think why, the last that, that's why precisely I have mentioned in my last slide that it is very important to examine your beneficial uh, ownership and do a thorough analysis. True, true. So that's 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 very critical. I think the last connected question on PN3 before I move to other topics is uh, it does investment in the form of non convertible instruments like optionally convertible preference shares or debentures uh, fall within the ambit of Presno 3. So let's say a foreign investor is subscribing to uh, optionally convertible preference share will at the time of subscription of such an instrument uh, uh, one has to obtain approval on Presno 3 assuming there is a Chinese leg involved or a or a you know, neighboring country leg involved? No, so let me clarify debt. Debt investments are not covered under Press Note 3. Press Note 3 actually makes an amendment under Regulation 6 of non debt instrument rules. And in terms of that, only uh, foreign investment, which is equity or equity like investment, that is covered under Press Note 3. Having said that, uh, when a foreign investor or anyone who is actually investing uh, by way of debt, uh, they can invest freely without any restriction subject to external commercial borrowing guidelines and press note 3 may come into picture only at the time of conversion so when you actually convert that debt into equity before that if the beneficial owner or your lender is located in china or hong kong then of course uh, approval requirement would get triggered but only at the time of conversion not at the time of debt investment 
right right so that's i think very clear to me and uh, just moving on i think uh, up till now again a uh, lot of questions around this foreign owned and controlled construct uh, you also presented on it uh, one specific question is if a foreign owned and controlled company is buying or selling shares to another foreign owned and controlled company uh, and it's planning to introduce the concept of a deferred consideration or indemnities does it have to comply and adhere with the fdi norms of 25 percent cap and 18 months on and so forth yeah it's a good question but this is actually there is a gray area around it because if you refer to regulation 23 under the non-debt instrument rules it actually talks about deferred consideration between a non-resident and a resident so the question uh, comes is whether a indian entity the focc entity uh, when it makes a downstream investment whether uh, you know deferred consideration requirements would get attracted so whether they can they can invest uh, they can defer it up to 25 percent or beyond 25 percent also or not in my view uh, since regulation 23 only talks about between a non-resident and a resident uh, my view would be you know more uh, you know uh, aggressive approach that uh, actually uh, the deferred consideration norms and other norms may not be applicable having said that the other school of thought is because regulation in regulation 23 uh, it is mentioned that such downstream investment is subject to sectoral conditions attendant condition etc that is school of thought says that since it is it is a capital account transaction and it is not specifically permitted uh, in the regulation so therefore uh, uh you know focc cannot do deferment at all uh what i suggest in such cases is that it is important for you to take into consideration views and clarifications either from your authorized dealer bank or an informal clarification from reserve bank of india but having said that there are market precedents uh wherein uh you know focc had deferred uh consideration uh, with respect to their downstream investments without any approval so 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 and in every case uh, depends upon the facts so it is very important to see the facts of your case as well but uh, in my view it can be done under the automatic route but take take uh, opinion uh, either from authorized dealer bank or from consultants or from reserve bank of india yeah no, i can i can understand the slight hesitation atul in giving a clear response very clearly but i think if I can read between the lines, you are saying, yes, it's permissible in the automatic route, but what is very important, the disclaimer in this webinar itself is that this is not a legal opinion. We are giving a pure legal view as, as the interpretation in abstract. Of course, every transaction is fact specific, uh, which office of RBI we are dealing with that has its own bearing because different officers have different interpretations which they can possibly take. Uh, it's very important to get bespoke customized advice and hopefully you will not do uh, a holdback or deferment just based on what Atul and I say here. So so that's the, uh, I, I think, one one part. But thanks for the candid reply, Atul. I think that's very appreciated. Uh, the next question is in the context of break fee. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, again, often, I think, grappled with by all of us as transactional lawyers. So in case of break fees payable by a resident to a non-resident uh, party, uh, will such a transaction need rb approval so just to give some context when parties do a term sheet or a binding agreement and and one party which breaches and walks away from the agreement because of that without any good reason the non-defaulting party is entitled to an amount which is called a break fee so whether that amount which is payable by the defaulting party atul will need rb approval the break fee yeah president so Every transaction, as I mentioned, uh, from foreign exchange perspective, would be actually categorized into either current account transaction or a capital account transaction. So the fundamental rule with respect to capital account transaction is that unless it's specifically permitted, is prohibited. And the fundamental rule with respect to current account transaction is unless it's specifically prohibited, is permitted. Now, what is capital account transaction is that when you are actually creating a capital asset and liability and what is current account is that anything which is not a capital a current account a capital account transaction is a current account transaction now 
in this particular case when you are actually um, uh, you know remitting money in relation to a break of a fee uh, that transaction uh, through that transaction you are not creating any assets etc or liabilities in your books it's just an ordinary transaction which is done in the ordinary course and in my view this is a current account transaction and as i mentioned since fundamental rule is that for current account transaction analysis is specifically prohibited is permitted since this is not prohibited under the foreign exchange regulation so in my view you can do it without any comment approval because this this would be treated as a payment in terms of your uh, contractual arrangement with the uh, other party right i think the only caveat atul if if uh, what i have seen sometimes authorized dealer banks take is if the amount is a huge massive amount uh, then i think they like to see the underlying documents and the bona fides and so on and so forth so i think that again yeah. always is critical those attendant facts i think as you mentioned so no, you 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 cannot remit any money without doing that reporting through form a2 and without providing the supporting documents so of course if authorized dealer bank is going to ask Having said that, as I mentioned, for all these foreign exchange transactions, wherever there is remittance, either inbound or outbound, make sure you check with your authorized dealers. Right. So I think the moving on to the next question, I think it's uh, it's again I think something which is often asked. Look, if you do end up violating a provision of foreign exchange laws, let's say you haven't filed form FCTRS about which you mentioned. Or you haven't, let's say, you have done a FOCC transaction and the AD bank takes a different view. Uh, what's the kind of penalty uh, a parties are looking at? Can it also lead to a uh, unwinding of the transaction in a worst case scenario, or is it monetary sums only? If so, how much? And what's the ordinary penalty you look at in normal case? I'm not talking about transactions which are laced with fraud or, or you know other other extraordinary circumstances so what's the normal guidance there Apple? see in my experience at least i have not seen uh, uh you know in my 20 years of experience i have not seen a transaction getting unwound because of non-compliance with foreign investment uh, policy provisions having said that if there is a contravention with respect to foreign direct investment policy provisions uh, the maximum penalty which is provided under the law is three times of the amount which is involved uh, but to make sure that this power is or this provision is not uh, used arbitrarily and at the same time to make it more reasonable understandable from foreign investors perspective reserve bank of india has laid down uh, uh, you know compounding proceeding regulations in which there is a clear cut formula which has been prescribed for uh, and and the penalty would depend upon uh, the amount involved uh, the nature of the contravention whether this contravention is a procedural contravention or it's a substantive contravention whether it's a deliberate or it's inadvertent similarly you know what is the period for which this contravention actually continued so all of these factors are taken into consideration uh before before final penalties being levied uh in relation to compounding one very important aspect with respect to compounding is that uh reserve bank of india may also ask you to go and take post facto approval with respect to such contravention now when i talk about post facto approval it means that you may have to go to the sector regulator and first take their approval to regularize the contravention and thereafter approach to reserve bank of india to get it compounded and pay the penalty since uh, many times the investors or parties are not aware about this so therefore they do not factor in these timelines uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, contravention with respect to some of the policy provisions so very important to uh, keep that in consideration when you are actually executing transaction documents right and how much time it entails because you know many a times Atul, when we do diligence from buyer side and we identify let's say our existing foreign exchange non-compliance we recommend to have that fixed as a cp condition precedent but how much time it typically takes two three months one month six months how much time it takes so so far as compounding proceedings are concerned under the compounding proceeding rules clearly 180 days timeline is provided for for to the reserve bank of india to look into the application and take a call but having said that if you have provided all the information if if the facts are clear if the amount is quantifiable 
then in that case and depending on your licensing depending on how you approach etc we have seen that such uh, contraventions are also compounded within a period of three to four months as well uh, in addition to that as as you asked uh, you also need to factor which i just highlighted sometimes rbi may direct you to go and get post facto approval so in such cases the timeline could be four months to get the post facto approval plus additional four to six months to get it compounded so 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 make sure that you have taken into consideration the nature of contravention whether it's a it, it is going to get for a post facto approval in addition to the compounding which we just discussed right the next question is slightly uh, i mean broad I'm, I'm mindful of the time we have 10 odd minutes so i will just try and take few more questions uh, i think one is on the common mistakes we have seen people make when approaching regulators or filing approvals and applications for approvals what common mistakes have you seen which our audience members can uh, perhaps avoid when they when they you know kind of uh, have to make an application so one of the most common mistake which i have seen is that uh, you know people file application without uh, making sure that their house is in order for example there may be previous non compliances and those may not have regularized or uh, you know uh, someone has not taken into consideration those contraventions and approves the regulator uh, uh, you know without without uh, clearing the, the the said contravention first and in that case what we have noticed is that if a regulator gets to know about it and in any case they get to know about it because uh, there is a lot of exchange of information between uh, various regulators so that actually either delays the application or leads to rejection and even in those cases where you have got the approval uh, that approval would be subject to compounding so which means that you have spent six to eight months in getting the approval then another six months in getting it compounded and uh, in such cases we have seen that you know transactions go here here so important to make sure that your house is in order before reaching out to the regulator also sometimes you know as i mentioned regulatory process uh, in a regulatory process you have to deal with the regulators and uh, a lot of this is basically kyc done with respect to parties so government gets comfortable if uh, you actually uh, reach out to them through known consultants known uh, uh, you know what you call authorized dealers so that you get get such kind of approval in a fast and expeditious manner otherwise otherwise uh, you know uh, many times there may be additional questions there may be questions which may lead towards rejection so these are two things which one should keep in mind and uh, this is one common mistake which i have seen at uh, at least right right time for one last question before we head to the poll in the concluding part and of course as i said whatever questions we haven't been able to respond we will definitely do so after the webinar uh, i think it's it's basically uh, i'm just sifting through here i think uh, from FCTRs, you talked about that earlier in the presentation in the context of share transfers. Now, let's say if that has not been filed in a historic share transfer, does it at all impact the title to the shares which is sought to be acquired, or is it just a procedural formality? What's the legal, you know, kind of uh, principle around that? So, actually, it will not impact the title, but it is more of a procedural non-compliance. And that is precisely why RBI actually brought this concept of late submission fee. So once the late submission fee has been paid uh, to the Reserve Bank of India, uh, so thereafter contravention is regularized, which means that the title is not going to get impacted. So it's just a procedural uh, non-compliance. And once that is rectified, then the title uh, gets absolute and is taken on record by the Indian entity. But having said that, to answer to your question, no, it is not going to impact the title uh, with respect to parties. Right, I've got a few more questions from FCTRs, but I'm mindful we are just awfully short on time now, but uh, I think I will definitely get back after this presentation. I think Mitesh, you can put the poll slide back on now. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Vatul, uh, for your thoughts. Very invigorating, very insightful. Before closing, I would like to ask each of you to respond to the poll slide on your screen to provide your feedback on how the webinar went today. We take this very seriously as part of our uh, continuous improvement endeavor. Uh, this will take a minute.
so i think in conclusion you know firstly uh, i would like to thank atul for sharing his experiences and expertise with us today quite a magnificent presentation i thought uh, thank you so much atul i think obviously we could not have done this without your uh, presence uh, you know and we are indebted to you and, and you did an outstanding job to our audience most importantly which keeps us going uh, you know i hope you found this webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time we certainly enjoyed bringing this to you uh, as i mentioned at the outset we will send you a copy of the webinar the 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 recording the summary notes uh, all of that we will also respond to each and every question which we could not take due to want of time uh, you will also get a feedback for request separately uh, it will just take barely a minute so please give your feedback criticisms comments even compliments everything is welcome uh, if you have any questions regarding this subject matter please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, uh, our our contact details would be there at the end as you can see on the screen right now and uh, thank you again for your attendance today and we look forward to being of service to you again in the new future all till then take care stay safe and all the very best thank you